Good evening, New Prospect. Welcome to Wednesday Night Prayer and Bible Study. We want to thank you guys for tuning in. My name is Josh Cruz. I'm the associate pastor here. And if we have any first-time guests or visitors, uh, we welcome you. Thank you for sharing your evening with us. Uh, we would love to share more information with you about who we are, what we do, and what we believe. Uh, we'd invite you to check out our website as well as our Facebook page. You can find a lot of information about us there. Uh, but if you still have questions, please reach out another way. Uh, give us a call or send us an email. We would love to answer any questions you might have and share next steps with how you can get involved with our family of faith. Before we jump into Bible study tonight, we do want to open it up for a time of prayer. Perhaps you have a request that's heavy on your heart that you would like us to be lifting on your behalf. Respond to this Facebook post, or you can reach out another way. Uh, but please, let us know about that. Uh, let us know we want to be lifting that up in prayer on your behalf. Uh, and uh, let's go ahead and take a look at tonight's prayer list. Let us continue to remember those uh, listed in Lynchburg General Hospital, many in need of uh, God's healing touch this week. Uh, we have been praying for Mr. Darnell Mormon, uh, as well as the others listed here at Lynchburg General and Danville and Sintera and Halifax as well. Many members at home, and uh, we are uh, excited to, to let you know that Mrs. Joyce Tucker is now at home. She was in Bedford Memorial Hospital, but uh, um, she is now resting at home, still in need of our prayers, but uh, we give God the, the praise that she is at home now as well. Many friends and family still in need of our prayers this week. Let's continue to lift each one. And we're expressing sincere Christian sympathy to the families of Mr. David Dalton, Mr. John Alborn, Mrs. Janice Davis, Mr. Bobby Jennings, Mr. Vicky, Mrs. Vicky Menace, Mr. Ronnie Pickrell, and Mrs. Janet Weeks. Uh, lots of names added to that list this week. Lots of families grieving the loss of a loved one. Uh, let's uh, remember these as well. Our homebound of the week is Miss Karen Catron, and our student of the week is Jillian Shelton. If we can be the hands and feet of Christ in their lives, let's do that. Let's uh, uh, send them a card, send them a text message, let them know that we're thinking of them and lifting them in prayer. We also want to uh, remember those in assisted living facilities across our area. And now with the many requests that's been lifted up, uh, would you just bow with me uh, as we go to the Lord in prayer? Lord, we come to you today, and Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for this time that we have to gather together as a family of faith, Lord. Uh, whether we're here in person or whether we're uh, joining online, Lord, we know that we are one family. Uh, and Lord, so we lift the concerns of our hearts, Lord. We lift the many names that have been listed, uh, and Lord, those that aren't listed. Lord, we, we know that you know them personally, individually, and that you know each and every need. And so, Lord, we pray for your healing hand. We pray for your comforting arm in every situation. Lord, we pray that you would draw them closer to you, that they would feel your presence. And, Lord, that they would rest in your guidance and your direction. And, uh, Lord, just experience peace that is only available through you. Uh, Lord, uh, we pray that we might be presented with an opportunity to be, their, uh, to be your hands and feet in their lives, Lord. Lord, we pray for those moments. We pray for those opportunities, Lord. And, uh, Lord, as we dive into your word tonight, Lord, we pray that you would use it to continue to sharpen us in our faith. Uh, Lord, that you would draw us closer to you in and through it, and that we would take it outside these four walls into the community around us. Lord, we praise you, we thank you, we love you, and we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Good evening. It's uh, good to have you with us by way of the internet and uh, joining us here at New Prospect Baptist Church as we uh, have finished one day, or one week, excuse me, in the season of Lent uh, as we begin our journey with Jesus towards Jerusalem. And uh, this week uh, we're going to restart our study of the book of Haggai. And uh, hopefully uh, sometime... Uh, in the next couple of weeks, we'll finish it because there's uh, not a lot to the book. I think there's something like two chapters and 38 verses. 
This evening we'll be in chapter 2, reading verses 1 through 9, and then we will study it, trying to not only learn what was taking place back then in uh, 520 B.C., uh, but how what was happening back then uh, can be applied to what's happening now in our world, uh, in our country, in our lives. So I invite you to open your Bibles to Haggai chapter 2. And uh, we will read together verses 1 through 9. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through Haggai the prophet. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shiltiel, governor of Judah, to the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and to the remnant of the people. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Doesn't it seem like nothing to you? Even so, be strong, Zerubbabel, the Lord's declaration. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, the Lord's declaration. Work. For I am with you, the declaration of the Lord of hosts. This is the promise I made to you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit is present among you. Don't be afraid. For the Lord of hosts says this, Once more in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations so that the treasures of all the nations will come and will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver and gold belong to me, the declaration of the Lord of hosts. The final glory of this house will be greater than the first, says the Lord of hosts. I will provide peace in this place, the declaration of of the Lord of hosts. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. It is a treasure to us. We hope, Lord, we value it in the right way, understanding that it is a light unto our, our feet, a, light, a lamp unto our path. We, we seek to live out its precepts and principles. And so we pray this evening, Lord, even as we study this ancient text, that we would find a modern application to it learning to be the people you've called us to be in this time in which we live, even as you called Haggai and the people of his day to be your faithful people as well. So bless us this evening as we study this portion of your word, and we offer the prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our text begins on the 21st day of the seventh month. And of course you will recall that back in the first chapter the book began by saying in the second year of King Darius on the first day of the sixth month. So about seven or eight weeks have passed by since uh, the first prophecy began. And it says after that, after it gives us this time, and it's there's a reason why that is very important because the 21st day of the seventh month would basically equate Uh, approximately to our October the 17th. It would have been the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a feast that lasted about seven days. And there would have been many people who would have traveled from the outskirts of town or or the city of Jerusalem into the city uh, for the festivities. And they would have maybe thought to themselves, well, let's see how the rebuilding project is going. Uh, It's not much different than uh, when we had people uh, about 16, 17 years ago who moved away from uh, Hurt or Alta Vista, and we started building this building, and they came back here, and they wanted to see the progress being made on the building of this building. And maybe you've had that as well. Uh, My son, my youngest son, Zach, he he and his wife are having a a house built, and uh, so... Uh, they go over there and, and watch the progress of what is taking place. And, 
And so we understand that uh, anticipation. And you want to see things are really progressing well. And maybe this is what was happening here. As we think of this, we have to also recall the setting for the book of Haggai. And we remember that what has occurred was in 587 B.C., the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. And then it just laid in waste for the most part uh, for a very, very long time until the Persian Empire conquered the Babylonians and allowed the return of the people to Jerusalem. There were some folks who had stayed there even after they were conquered, uh, but many people streamed back to the city and then witnessed the ruins. You'll recall that uh, a rebuilding program began. People started rebuilding their houses. People started rebuilding businesses. People started just rebuilding their lives in this place that had been their ancient home but had not been their home for a long time. Progress was made on a personal level, uh, but not so much on a religious level, especially in the regards to the rebuilding of the temple. And so even though it had started some 16 to 18 years before, uh, it still basically was nothing much more than a foundation. And that's where Haggai comes in. He goes and he says, look, you've rebuilt all of this stuff, but you've ignored this part of your religious life. And the temple is representative of you as a people and your relationship to God. And so you need to begin this in earnest. And so they did. Now, we can imagine that after the destruction that is taking place in Ukraine, that when the people come back and they see the magnitude of what lies before them in trying to rebuild their country, they may find themselves filled with despair, uh, wondering if they're up to the challenge. So maybe as we look on our TV sets and see all of those buildings being destroyed and, and just imagine you know, what will take place, we'll think about that as well. We have people in this church family, uh, some of them uh, who went and served in Germany after World War II in the early 1950s. Uh, during the time of the Korean conflict, uh, most people, if you uh, were drafted into the army, you were either sent to one of two places, either to Korea or to Germany. And you were part of the occupation. And even at that time, some eight years after the war being over, there was still a lot of devastation in that place. Now, on the seventh month also may have been uh, an important thing for them to remember as well. You see, if you go back and you look into the book of Kings, what you discover there is that the original temple, Solomon's temple, that Solomon dedicated that temple with all the glorious you know, structure it was and with all the magnificent vessels he had put in, he dedicated that temple during the seventh month. Now, I don't know about you, but put it this way. Have you ever, um, have you ever when you're celebrating Christmas or some, some holiday or some birthday, uh, for us it's Christmas, do you ever look back at pictures of, of times gone by and, and you look at what you had then and how it was and everything? Maybe, maybe you even look back in your pictures and you saw if you had a live tree, the tree you had back then and the tree you have today, and you're comparing the two. And that could very well take place, especially in a time and in the seventh month when people are get, gathering together for this festival and they start talking about the glory of the former temple. And as they're talking about the glory, you know, one of the things that we typically do when we're talking about the glory of a former thing is we elevate it, even in its magnific magnificence. You know, we make it even better than it was, and the temple was great. So you can imagine how they were speaking about it then, because people were saying, oh, man, that temple was just wonderful. Then they look at the present structure, and they become even more despondent and depressed as they think about the magnificence of the former one. Now, what does that do? 
that gives you not much hope for what you're doing in the present. I mean, put it this way. If we're working hard on something, something that has existed for quite some time, but we believe our present efforts will not bear anywhere near the fruit that the former one did, then we might find ourselves saying, what's the use? And that way, our despondency leads to depression, and that leads us to quit the work at hand. And to tell you the truth, we can understand this in a way. Um, many of you may be watching this right now, studying along in this. Maybe you grew up, as I did, um, in the late 50s or early 60s. You, you may be part of the, what's called the baby boomer generation, or maybe a little bit before, or a little bit after, afterwards. But what I know about that generation is this. It's, if you go back, if you go back and look at almost any churches, quote, unquote, what their longtime members refer to as the glory years, it will, for the most part, be somewhere between the 1960s, early 60s, through the 80s. And part of that is because of the fact that the baby boomers were part of a generation uh, that was the largest of its time. And not only that, you had all of these, these men and, and women, too, returning from war in World War II and the Korean conflict who set about building their lives. And one of the things that they became involved in was the church. And so the church was this wonderful place. You go back and you look at some of the pictures of New Prospect Baptist Church, our, our pictorial directory from the 1970s. And I have one up in my office, and, and it's just filled, filled, filled with pictures of people. You look at the sanctuary, and it's filled to capacity, choir loft filled and everything else. And people say, look at what we once had. You look at all the different things like uh, Royal Ambassadors and uh, GAs and the WMU and, and all of these ministries and mission opportunities of the church. And, and you remember that. And yet today, you know, you wonder what. And then you look at the number of children typically in the average family back then. And you realize very families are that large today. And you can understand the difference. But if you look at the past and remember the grandeur of it, and you look at what's taking place today as we're in the midst of recovering and restructuring from the pandemic, you might say, huh, we're not what we used to be. And seldom we are. Just like these folk here are thinking about the past and they have to deal with the present. And that's why in verse 3 we've read, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Doesn't it seem like nothing to you? Now, sometimes you can think of former glory. It can cause you to do some horrific things. We, we are told that one of the reasons, that one of the things that motivated Putin to, to attack Ukraine was that he wanted to restore Russia to its former glory. Maybe the former glory of the USSR, or maybe the Russia, you know, when it, when it was in its, uh, you know, glory years as well. And it's led him to do some horrific, you know, what does, what does the former glory mean concerning this temple? We don't know. As we think about it, though, uh, we go back and we we look at the, the, the time of it, we, we understand that, okay, 587 B.C., this is 520, 67 years have passed since that day. Now, if you go back and you read Ezra 3, what you will discover, uh, in Ezra 3, chap, uh, verse 12, it reads this way, but many of the older priests, Levites, and family member leaders who had seen the first temple wept loudly when they saw the foundation of this house, but many others shouted joyfully. Now, many others who hadn't seen it were happy to see the progress that had been made. Now, but the one thing we have to understand is that portion of Ezra, Ezra 3, verse 12, was written about 536 B.C. That was 16 years prior to Haggai's prophecy here. 
A lot of people who may have been older and alive uh, when the first temple was in existence probably died over that period of time. So we don't know for certain if, if Haggai's speaking literally. How many of you saw the former temple? Or is he speaking rhetorically? How many of you saw the former temple? None of you, right? We, we can't tell for certain. Now the rebuilding of this temple will take four years and it will not be completed until the third day of Adar in the sixth year of King Darius. And remember what we said in chapter 1, verse 1, in the second year of King Darius. So that is four years. Now in the face of all this, not just the appearance of the temple the present appearance of the temple, but also in the appearance of the people, their disappointment, their depression, their disillusionment. God makes two declarations to them. This is what he says. Even so, be strong, Zerubbabel, the Lord's declaration. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, the Lord's declaration. Work, for I am with you, the declaration of the Lord of hosts. Now, as we read this, maybe your translation read, instead of uh, be strong, it might have read, take courage. The Hebrew word is hezak, hezak. And Peter Verhoff, in his commentary, writes that the word hezak denotes a frame of mind which enables one to pursue or initiate something with fervor and diligence. Hezak, be strong, be courageous. Does that sound familiar to you? Some of you, some of you may love the book of Joshua. And if you go back to Joshua chapter one, what you discover is repetitively uh, Joshua is saying to the people who are getting ready to enter the land, of course, through God, be strong and courageous. You see the repetition here. Be strong and courageous. Why? Because you are strong and courageous in and of yourself? No, no. Because then he goes on and he says, be strong and courageous because you have a work to do. And what is that work? It's the rebuilding of the temple. And what is the motivation for all this taking place? God says, for I am with you. Now you go back into another prophetic book, the book of Ezekiel. And what you discover is that Yahweh's glory, their God, Yahweh, his glory had left the temple and the sinful city of Jerusalem. So it was absent from them. It was absent from the temple, which was supposed to be the place where God's presence was really felt, where heaven and earth somehow touched one another. And now God offers the promise of his presence to encourage the work to continue. Now, that little verse that reads, this is the promise I made you when you came out of Egypt and my spirit is present among you, don't be afraid. That particular verse is not found in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And so there are some commentators, biblical scholars, who believe that somehow that verse, that verse was an editorial gloss and Basically, what that means is some later editor was looking at the, uh, the, the text and decided to add this in there. And you say, well, why in the world would they do that? Because they were recalling the history of the people. There's another thing with it, is there's some structural difficulties with the text as well, with that particular verse. But what we do sense here is what Smith says about the verse that it is an echo of the liturgy of covenant renewal and it is placed here in this 
particular, you know, in between where God is saying, work for I am with you, the declaration of the Lord of hosts, it is placed there between that, that section and the, fr- the further section where we see in verses 6 through 9 sort of a promise for the future. A promise for the future. So, if this is an echo of the liturgy of covenant renewal, which Smith says it is, what it is telling the people is, you work today, you work in the promise of today, but you also work for the promise of the future. In other words, if you do not do your work right now, then, then what are the people in the future going to have to, to work with? And in some ways, that's what we are constantly doing as a country, as a church, as a community. We're not just working for ourselves, but we're working for the people who will come after us. Now, this is the promise of the future. And in it, we also, we, we sense that Haggai is referring back to some previous prophecies that are found in other books of the Bible. We, we see a connection here between his words and those of Isaiah that you find in Isaiah chapter 9 and 60 and 62. You also hear echoes of Micah chapter 4 and 5. And these are always, you know, looking to the future. And we call that eschatology, when you're looking to the time when all of the things that God has promised will come to fruition. In other words, God, God has a purpose. God has a purpose for creation. He not only has a purpose for people, he has a purpose for everything he has created uh, to bring it back uh, the way he originally intended for it to be. And, and as he thinks about that, he also thinks about the temple and what it will be in that future that he is promising to the people here. And that's why in verse 6 he writes, For the Lord of hosts, remember the Lord of the Lord's army, you know, whatever. The Lord of hosts says this, Once more, in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the seas and the dry land. And, and God is, is not just going to shake nature, and he's going to shake it suddenly and powerfully, but he's also going to shake the nations. The whole universe will be impacted. And if you wonder why, why does God do that, uh, look at Psalm uh, chapter 8, verse 1. Lord, O Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You have covered the heavens with your majesty. In other words, God owns everything, so it belongs to him. I think of it almost, you know, when I was listening to this, and there, of course there, there may, we, might, we might even hear echoes of a militaristic endeavor, uh, like, like the world's being shaken right now. But the vision that came to me as I was hearing this, especially as it talks about uh, the nations being shaken and them bringing their silver and gold and uh, so that the temple will be uh, surpass its former glory, is that I started thinking of a small child. And what does a small child do? A small child looks and when he wants or she wants to purchase something, uh, at least we used to, I don't know about you, but we used to go and we would shake our piggy banks until enough money fell out uh, that we could take it and, and do with it what we wanted. But the money belonged to us, so we had the right to shake that piggy bank, right? Well, God, God has a right to shake everything because all of it belongs to him. All of it. The silver and the gold, the totality of all the precious metals and their value belong to God. You see, he is sovereign over the entire world, over all of the creation. And so what is being expressed here is God actually has exclusive rights to the wealth of all nations. Look back at verse 8 there. The silver and gold belong to me. The declaration of the Lord of hosts. Now as we look at that, we also must understand something. When it says that God is shaking the nations, there's an implication, I think, here. And that is that somehow, not 
not only is God shaking the nation so he can get from them what he wants, but he is shaking the nations so that they will come into a covenant relationship with him. That's God's desire, that all, you know, and that's the vision that you have, like in the book of Revelation, you know, where every tribe and every nation, you know, all peoples uh, will come. Every, and, and we read, every knee shall bow. Uh, that's an all-inclusive term, every knee shall bow. God bringing the whole of all the nations into a right relationship with himself. Now, in the final verse that we're studying this evening, it says the final glory of this house will be greater than the first. So even if they're looking at the present temple and they're thinking about the past temple, uh, it being more glorious than this second one, God says, you know what? There's going to be a future for the temple that will surpass even that first one. And then he goes on to say, I will provide peace in this place, the declaration of the Lord of hosts. That is the way the Holman Christian Study Bible translates it. It may be that your Bible translation reads the prosperity. The Hebrew word that is being translated in both instances is the word shalom. And quite possibly, You've heard of that word, shalom. And this is, where, this is where Haggai is pointing to the blessings of the Messianic age, where all people will share in this peace, this prosperity, this wholeness, this wellness of God through faith. And until that time, we're not to so be enamored with some future that we can't think about the present, but we're to work in the present until that future comes. Some of you uh, recall that old song, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes. And that's what we are called to do. I know sometimes you and I get frustrated. I mean, think about it. 2,000 years ago, about, Jesus gave to his followers uh, that great commission, go into all the world, right? Preaching the good news of the kingdom. Making disciples. And, And we're still a long ways from making disciples of all the world. And that can be frustrating. But that should not keep us from being faithful in our generation. Just like Haggai was just talking to those folks in the 6th century B.C., encouraging them to be faithful because Yahweh was present with them. We know Yahweh is present with us as well. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your presence with us in these tumultuous times. Lord, we look around us and we see everything that is happening in our world and in our country and in the culture at large. And sometimes, Father, we get exasperated. We feel overwhelmed. And yet our confidence comes not, Lord, through what we believe man can accomplish, but because we know what you can accomplish through men. We pray, God, even for ourselves that because you are present with us, that your shalom, your peace, would be experienced by other people because of the work you've called us to do. Bring us to peace with one another, even as we pray for Ukraine and Russia to come to peace. We think over there of the Orthodox Church, of both nations being called to this form of your church and we we know lord that the nations are at odds with each other but we pray god for our brothers and sisters they would seek peace with each other guide us now lord as we go about our own lives as we have been called to be
peacemakers because you said that in doing so we will be blessed and help us to experience the shalom that you promise us through Jesus. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I look forward to seeing you next week. God's blessings upon you as, uh, as you study his word and as you live it out.